Welcome to UO Today. I'm Barbara Altman, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our guest today is Ian McNeely, Associate Professor of History at the University of Oregon and President of Phi Beta Kappa's Alpha, Alpha Chapter of Oregon. Phi Beta Kappa celebrates and advocates excellence in the liberal arts and sciences. Its campus chapters invite for induction the most outstanding arts and sciences students at America's leading colleges and universities. The Society sponsors activities to advance the study of humanities, social sciences, and natural sciences in higher education and in society at large. McNeely is also the current chair of the UO's Undergraduate Council. The Council takes a broad, university-wide view of undergraduate education, reviewing overall objectives and suggesting improvements. It works closely with the Vice Provost for Undergraduate Studies to establish criteria for excellent general education courses and to promote coherence, quality, and rigor across the curriculum. McNeely, along with Rene Dorian, an alumna of the Clark Honors College, curated an exhibit called Letters, Laurels, and Keys, a tradition of honors at the U of O. The exhibit takes a comprehensive look at both historic and contemporary honors societies, honors programs, and achievements of scholar-athletes at the University of Oregon. It is on display in the Knight Library and at the Living Learning Center until June 21st, 2010. Ian, welcome back to UO Today. Thanks for having me. We're really glad to have you come and talk to us about this particular exhibit because I think a lot of people will want to come and see mm -hmm. it. But to back up just a little bit so we get some history behind it, could you tell us about Phi Beta Kappa as a society and then its history at Oregon? Yes. Uh, it's not widely known, but Phi Beta Kappa is the oldest Greek letter fraternity in the United States. Uh, uh, it's as old as the Republic itself, so founded in 1776 at William and Mary College. Um, and in some ways, the model for social fraternities that to this day carry Greek letters uh, in their names. Um, at its inception, it did have a social function. It was very secretive, in fact, uh, but over the course of the 19th century devolved into an, an honors society, recognizing academic achievement. Uh, and so our chapter at Oregon was founded in 1923, making it the oldest in the state. That's why we're called Alpha of Oregon, first letter of the Greek alphabet. Uh, I think the second was at Reed. They're called Beta of Oregon. Uh, and so we've been around for about 87 years now, just here in Eugene. I read, make sure that I'm correct on this, would you mm -hmm. please, that uh, the University of Oregon has the only chapter of Phi Beta Kappa at a public institution in Oregon, although there are a couple of private schools that have them as well. You mentioned Reed? Yes, I believe Reed and Lewis and Clark have chapters as well, uh, but among public state universities, uh, we're the only one. How did you become president? Well, a, a co it, it sort of spreads by word of mouth. And, and one thing we're trying to do uh, going forward is, is not to rely purely on that informal connection uh, to recruit new faculty members to participate. Uh, but a colleague of mine in the history department was an outgoing president himself, uh, asked if I'd like to come to a meeting. I came that day. I left as vice president, uh, having no prior knowledge of how this particular organization works. I was in Phi Beta Kappa in college, of course, so I knew what it was about. Um, and then from that point forward, it was just uh, you know, meeting folks from across the university who participate in our membership committee and plan events and things of that nature. Now, the last time we had you on the show, Ian, we were talking, among other things, about a recent book that you co-authored with Lisa Wolverton. Mm -hmm. The title of that book is Reinventing Knowledge from Alexandria to the Internet. And I was struck by the fact that the kind of the, the packaging of knowledge, the way we organize knowledge, knowledge as political capital, mm -hmm. is something you're interested in in a number of different ways. Is that part of your interest in Phi Beta Kappa? Yeah, I think my intellectual career, the, the period of time that I've spent aware of ideas as they're discussed in our society has coincided with the crisis of the humanities. And so I, I feel like my entire professional identity is wrapped up with that uh, uh, effort to redeem liberal education. Uh, and so the book that I wrote on reinventing knowledge was an attempt to give an historical perspective on that uh, crisis, in some ways to, uh, to downplay its, uh, its threat, but and also uh, to recognize it. And so too with Phi Beta Kappa, I think we're trying to fight the good fight, uh, convince people we're not some embattled group of elitists who attend to uh, obscure academic matters, but do have relevance to students and to the wider public, even now in 2010. 
Well, that's the perfect entree for me to ask <laughs> you the next question. Panning back a little, uh -huh. not only considering Phi Beta Kappa, but the other honor societies available, what is the value for students of honor societies and other programs of that kind? I think it gives a structure to uh, whatever students want to pursue. Um, and here I would emphasize that, as I learned myself in the, in the uh, process of co-curating this with Renee Dorian, there's a lot of honors opportunities out there besides Phi Beta Kappa. We recognize a particular set of uh, achievements in liberal arts and sciences. Um, there are other societies and programs on campus that also do that. Um, but we've got um, societies in the professional schools. Uh, we've got societies for scholar athletes. We've got recognitions for uh, people um, doing service uh, opportunities and community service, things like that. And you know, I think when you when you look at it in that broad perspective, you realize that honors aren't just for an elite. Uh, they give people of various inclinations, various career ambitions, various levels of scholastic achievement, the chance to kind of find their way and work towards something. So that by the end of their four years or five years here, they they've got a they've got a credential to show for it. Um, and something they can be proud of. Is it something that students become involved in towards the end of their studies, or do you do they can they begin right as freshmen? How where where do your members come from in the student body? In Phi Beta Kappa, it's something people only tend to become aware of at the end of their senior years, and we're trying to correct that. Uh, we're set up in Phi Beta Kappa essentially to review transcripts at the end of college. Uh, and then invite people to come to an initiation ceremony, which for many is the first they've ever heard of the society. Uh, if they haven't happened to have family members or friends who have been involved, there's no reason they would. Uh, by contrast, the Honors College, the Society for College Scholars, uh, Mortar Board, the McNair Fellows, these are all opportunities that occur much earlier in college, in some cases in the first year, uh, to give people a track, to give people uh, a means of getting on board with um, whatever type of honors they want to seek. So then if one becomes a Phi Beta Kappa member, if one is inducted late in one's undergraduate career, what does it do for somebody afterwards? I understand it's an extra quarter inch on the CV and a mm -hmm. credential, as you put mm -hmm. it, and therefore really endorses their success in their academic undergraduate work. But what happens after you leave college? Um, you get a you get a newsletter. Uh, I had the opportunity to write the uh, article for this quarter's newsletter. It goes to folks all over the nation, um, and, and and that's that's ultimately it. It's, I think one of the things that's hard to convince people uh, of in joining Phi Beta Kappa is that it, it really is for your own satisfaction. Uh, ultimately, it, it certainly helps on the resume. Lots of employers recognize it. Certainly, graduate school admission uh, committees do. Um, but in some ways it is designed to be the capstone of the career rather than launching into something new. You mentioned that um, honor societies are often associated with a notion of elitism at the mm. university. Is that an obstacle to, um, to managing to, to get students to participate in honors programs, the ones that are open to them earlier? I think it is, but only insofar as we don't sufficiently publicize what it is we do and what it is we don't do. Um, as I said, lots of people have never heard of Phi Beta Kappa, including some of our very top graduates, the Oregon Six. Um, and so to the extent that there is a, a vague notion out there about what we do, it's associated with these Greek letters that we have. Um, if people have seen any of its uh, publicity materials, uh, there might be a fife and drum procession. It reeks of colonial Williamsburg. That's indeed where it was founded. Uh, especially out here on the West Coast, that seems to be a world very far removed from us. Um, and so just to get people to consider us, we have to dist distance ourselves to some extent from those stereotypes. Um, and, uh, and that is a challenge. A lot of people want to know uh, if we're shaking them down for money, if this is a kind of who's who in American university life uh, type of scam. Uh, a lot of people want to know, understandably, why are we asking you to pay $75 to join if all I get is a newsletter? Uh, and so kind of contending with those very legitimate concerns is, is in some ways our first um, order of business. I read your newsletter article, mm -hmm. and in there you talk about the populism of Oregon and how that's mm -hmm. a strain that perhaps distinguishes the culture of higher education here on the West Coast than 
the East Coast, mm -hmm. and you just made reference to that as well. Do you think there's a cultural split in this regard between East Coast, West Coast schools? I do. I don't want to overplay its significance, and I want to recognize, too, that even on the East Coast, there's a huge diversity of institutions. But that's historically where the most elite institutions have been centered and, and remain so largely to this day. Um, and so when I came out here, I was educated at two, let's say, two elite universities in the Eastern time zone. Um, actually, my first impression was very positive of Oregonians and, and Oregon's culture in this regard. There is a, a very healthy egalitarianism, a very healthy informality, uh, a very healthy suspicion of concentrations of wealth and power. We've got a, a, a referendum process that sometimes works and sometimes doesn't, but is meant to express the wishes of the people. Um, and that, at the same time, comports with a, a bookishness, um, a respect for ideas, um, um, a curiosity uh, about things of an academic nature, uh, valuing of culture. We've got the Bach Festival, we've got Powell's up the road, largest independent bookstore in the world. And I think that's a really good combination of things to have, intellectual and yet egalitarian, populist without being anti-ideas. Um, and, and so, again, that makes it a little harder for us to convince people to join a society simply because it goes back to 1776. But in, in, in more positive ways, it invites us to say, well, how does this serve the life of the mind, given that you are interested in, in it? Um, and that's, that's the challenge we, we face. So tell me about the exhibit that you and Renee Dorian have uh, organized. What was, mm. the, what was the genesis of that project? Uh, well, Renee has done the lion's share of the work and deserves most of the credit. She is the um, chair of the committee uh, producing the Clark Honors College's 50th anniversary. Uh, so the Clark Honors College is the oldest honors college at a four-year public university in the United States, uh, set up in 1960 and still going strong to this day. Um, and I think they realized quickly that, that this was a chance to celebrate not only themselves, but honors opportunities all over uh, campus. And so that's when Renee began to dig up things and put things together that no one had bothered to do before, to, to create a kind of roadmap of honors societies. Uh, and she's come up with some in incredible stuff, both past and present, things that I certainly didn't know about, um, despite having participated in Phi Beta Kappa for several years now. Can you talk about some of the things on display and perhaps where she found them? Does this mean that she dug through the archives? Or yeah. yeah. Yeah, she dug through the archives. She dug through old yearbooks. There is a yearbook. I, I don't know if it's still being published. It's called the Aragana. Um, and uh, it's like one of those kind of, you know, uh, classic yearbooks with all the students in it. Um, found newspaper articles. Uh, I, I was looking through one today. Um, an alumna, let me see if I get this straight. I was contacted recently by a woman whose grandmother was inducted into Phi Beta Kappa in 1923. Uh, she wanted to verify this was the case, so Renee was able to produce a newspaper article from the Oregonian that year where this woman's name was featured. And right below the article, it, it, there was a warning about over shampooing your hair. Uh, because I guess soap back in those days wasn't quite as technologically sophisticated as it is now. Uh, so there's just lots of tidbits. We've got uh, a, a picture of Mickey Mouse wearing a, a Phi Beta Kappa key in the 1930s. Uh, so one of the things that uh, this shows is that at that time, we had a much, Phi Beta Kappa had a much wider popular resonance perhaps than we do today, if, if Mickey Mouse is any indicator. What do you think that the campus community and the community off campus are going to get from this exhibit? I, I hope it, it will provide a road map for people. Um, even after the exhibit comes down, we're going to try to archive it in some way, feature it on the website of the university. Because as I've said, as I've said in addition to um, uh, the, the sheer value of displaying these things and profiling students, which is another thing that uh, we're doing, um, it, it's really intended to provide a service for students coming through the pipeline now. Uh, who uh, in many cases haven't heard of these opportunities, but could perhaps be steered to the one that best matches their interests. And that's the, the best antidote, I think, to elitism, is to say that, that you know, we take a broad view of what constitutes honors and we'll help you to find that which matches your own interests.
It seems like a really terrific idea to include in this display to honor student athletes mm -hmm. who have um, achieved real success academically. That's perhaps the best possible antidote for the more negative kinds mm -hmm. of press that the athletics programs have been having recently. Is that, uh, is that a deliberate strategy here? Yeah, I, na naturally we couldn't have anticipated the scandals involving athletes recently, but you see what staggering discipline it takes to achieve uh, within athletics, within academics, uh, not to mention to combine the two. Uh, so you go take a look at, at the people who are profiled there, uh, and you see that, that that discipline, that focus, that achievement correlates across the board. Um, and I do think we, you know, especially in times like, like we're now uh, facing in the university, uh, we've got to remind people that there are some very impressive individuals who manage to straddle both sides of this divide. Yeah, and I know the university does deliberately emphasize the term student athlete so mm -hmm. that we don't lose sight of that piece of their crucial experience here on yes. campus. Yeah. yeah. So, Ian, I'd like to change the conversation <coughs> to a slightly different track, but obviously highly related to mm -hmm. your other concerns, and that is your role on the undergraduate council. Mm -hmm. Um, I've seen as a faculty member now the, the blog that your, your committee has set up, um, the discussion of great inflation in the campus newspaper. What is the relationship between great inflation and honor societies and recognizing real achievement in mm -hmm. your opinion? Um, I guess I should say that the, I first became aware of the issue of great inflation through serving on Phi Beta Kappa's membership committee. Uh, and there I noticed two things. One is that the, at the, among the very highest GPAs in the university, and we review those transcripts routinely, there's a, a, a huge disparity in the way departments grade. And I, I won't name names, but uh, as you go through reading these transcripts over time, you begin to see that some departments feature a huge number of A pluses, almost routinely uh, at the upper division, for example. And other departments, uh, it seems difficult to get more than a B plus, especially in hard, traditionally rigorous courses. And what you begin to do is compensate uh, subconsciously for those disparities. You, you draw on your whatever stereotypes you may have developed about this department being an easy grader, that department being a higher grader, and fudge the numbers in your, in your, uh, in your deliberations. Now, we don't rely solely on numbers, but we, those are important. And yet we don't want to rely on stereotypes. We don't want to be uh, 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 doing that. The other thing is we, we noticed we were letting too many people in uh, by the standards of the national organization because we have a GPA cutoff and more and more people were piling in on top of that cutoff. So as I, as I got involved in the undergraduate council, there I realized there was a, a broad-based concern that our grades are losing some of their integrity. They're allowed to creep upwards. They don't mean as much as they used to mean. And so if you're trying to distinguish truly excellent students uh, from those who are also very strong but not in that top tier, from those who are not uh, making the grade, um, great inflation undercuts your ability to do that. And we just want to gently, without alarming students or instructors, without pushing grades down across the board by any means, uh, we want to arrest that process before it gets too late. Tell me a little bit about the numbers. I think the council tracked um, grades between 1992 and 2004. Mm -hmm. What kind of a portrait of grade inflation did you get from that work? During that time period, the number of A's went up by 10 percent. So uh, uh, lots more A's being awarded. Uh, the number of A's and B's went up. Uh, those two grades together went up by 7 percent, uh, commensurately fewer C's, D's, and F's. Uh, meaning that the overall GPA uh, of Oregon students went up by about 5 percent. Um, this doesn't put us out, outside the norm for the United States. This is happening everywhere. Um, but if left unchecked, eventually, it will, there's no reason to think that it'll stop happening. It's been happening for decades, uh, and I think it's time to, to signal the problem and begin asking what we should do to stop it. Is there a national trend to, to look at great inflation, or are we on the forefront in this? There's a national trend to look at great inflation. There are a couple of schools that have taken what I feel are overly uh, uh, punitive measures uh, to rein it in. Princeton is the most widely known. They capped the number of A's a department could give across all of its classes, and they fine those departments if they don't meet that standard. Um, that sent a powerful message. Princeton could 
perhaps get by with it because they're Princeton, even they raised concerns that all of a sudden, how will we compete with people from Yale and Dartmouth? Um, so we're trying to be at the forefront, but in a different way. We're framing it around a discussion of raid culture. We're not trying to cram any particular uh, uh, um, top-down policies uh, down people's throats. We've got some proposals. They're quite specific, but we're soliciting feedback on them. Would you mind explaining briefly what those three proposals are? I believe there are three of them on yes. which you're, you're soliciting input from both students and faculty, right? Yes, from students and faculty on a blog, town hall meetings, different media. Number one is have departments formulate in flexible but public ways what they consider to quality in their fields. What counts as an A, what counts as a B, what counts as a C. Um, number two is to give statistics to instructors so that they themselves know whether they're grade inflators. I don't know whether I tend to give more A's than my colleagues. This will allow me to see if that's the case and make any appropriate adjustments. Uh, number three is to put uh, uh, contextual information on the student transcript. So next to uh, uh, the grade you would get in a large gen ed class, uh, for example, you might have this, the number, the percentage of A's awarded in that class. So that a transcript reader can say, that was a class that was graded harshly, that was a class that was graded leniently, and not rely on their own subconscious stereotypes about, about what those are. Instead, to have statistics to understand uh, what those uh, judgments are based on. So in a way, that third proposal of adding contextual information on the transcript would allow someone reading it to figure out a student's standing in a particular class mm -hmm. based on those statistics, right? Yeah. What's the result so far? What, what, can you get a general tenor of the comments you are receiving on the blog? Uh, almost uniformly civil. Um, so, uh, <laughs> some have been critical. <laughs> Uh, I would say that, that the majority from students and faculty alike, the majority of the comments are positive. People have understandably lots of concerns and, and, and the devil's in the details in terms of how we phrase these policies and how we go about enacting them. Um, and we've gotten a lot of really good suggestions about how to, how to couch it in just the right way. But I, I've been pleasantly surprised to learn that people widely perceive this as a problem already and are kind of itching for somebody to step up and do something about it. Um, and that's one of the reasons we're taking a deliberately consultative approach. We're not, you know, trying to ram something through the Senate, and uh, you know, and we're involving the people who, by all rights, are not in charge of assigning grades. The students. I mean, we're not infringing on the faculty's ultimate responsibility, but we are trying to communicate with students because they're the ones to whom we are communicating when we assign grades. One of the things that may not have been your central concern, but I think will be a peripheral benefit of doing this discussion and perhaps articulating criteria in each unit is when new faculty arrive, how can they possibly know what their colleagues are doing, what mm -hmm. is appropriate? I remember feeling quite lost as a new faculty member. What's an A? What's a B? Yeah. We draw faculty from across the country, from across the world. We come from very different institutional cultures. I think it would be a really fruitful discussion uh, to hold to do that within a department. Mm -hmm. Has your department begun these discussions? No, we haven't. And, and I do sense from my own colleagues uh, and from different departments across the university a reluctance to infringe on the faculty member's individual freedom to set his or her own standards. And I, I'm trying to convince people that what we're doing is not in any way going to infringe on the content nor the pedagogy of the course. It, it really is designed for people who would like to know what the standards are um, and are happy to adjust their grading practices. You know, not to, to get in some rigid lockstep with everyone else. But just, just to be part of the same institutional culture, as you put it. I think there's a lot of consciousness raising to be done among faculty and among students. And mm -hmm. I think one of the things that this might counter is something that many of us in the classroom see all the time, which is um, a kind of an assumption that one should be graded on effort rather mm -hmm. than on achievement or success. Right. Is that an underlying agenda here? It is. I mean, we th there are some disciplines that do grade in a kind of you know have you met have you crossed this bar um, just just by put showing up and putting in the work. Uh, but really, it w you know, if grades are to have a meaning and they do have a meaning in our culture, they to some extent differentiate among different levels of achievement, and that can't you know be primarily based on 
just attending or just showing up or just trying hard. Um, you know, we're not trying to get all competitive about it, but, uh, um, but we do feel that grades do have to be restored to that, that you know, level where they communicate a different sta you know, stage of achievement to different students. How soon, if you can anticipate, do you think that the university might adopt some of the new principles? Our earliest would be fall 2010. So we as a council don't have the power to enact these policies. That's for the university senate to decide. We're trying to empower them with the best recommendations we can generate from this process uh, and facilitate their deliberations as they go about enacting a policy. Um, and that, that will hopefully happen next year. And one last question, Ian, to bring this back around to the, the really fascinating idea of honor societies. You mentioned that uh, you became aware of the issue of great inflation because of your involvement with Phi Beta Kappa. Mm -hmm. Is that then something that the Phi Beta Kappa Society across the country is discussing? Are they adjusting their cutoffs? How are they managing this? It's all done locally. So they stipulate you have to bring in, on average, no more than 10%. Uh, of your population and how you set your criteria is left to in the individual chapter initiatives. One thing I'd like to see the national organization do more of is take a, a leading role in these policy discussions. Um, they do many great things, but there is, there is the, the fear that, that they're headed toward a certain obsolescence because the big issues are out there and, and they need to take a stand on them as well. And one detail, have you ever seen anyone turn down an invitation to become a Phi Beta Kappa member? I have. I, I've, I've had a couple of emails from people who are slightly ticked off that we've been rummaging through their transcripts <laughs> and, um, and a little put off, too, by the perceived elitism of it. So I'm trying to communicate that that's not our intent. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're going to close on that note. Okay. Thanks very much for coming to talk to us about this. Well, thanks again for having me. Our guest today has been Ian McNeely, Associate Professor of History at the U of O and President of Phi Beta Kappa Alpha, Alpha Chapter of Oregon. Along with Renee Dorian, McNeely organized an exhibit called Letters, Laurels, and Keys, a Tradition of Honors at the U of O. The exhibit is on display in the Knight Library and at the Living Learning Center until June 21, 2010. Thank you for watching and see you next time.